welcome back to the Devin Nunes podcast. This is our year in review with, I think, everybody's favorite guest, Victor Davis mm -hmm. Hansen, who is my friend, mentor, neighbor in California when I'm not at True Social Headquarters in Florida. Victor, thanks for being here. We're going to try to run through the whole year. It's been a lot. And, you know, a, lot yeah. of new, a lot of new information in the news nowadays, that's for sure. Yeah. I'm good so, to see you guys. And Victor's got Victor's on uh, True Social at VDH. You can read all of his latest posts and his podcast, uh, the Victor Davis Hansen podcast, that is, I think, one of the top ones in the country. Um, Victor's wrote many books. If you want a book on uh, on World War II, I still believe that that's one of the best books that he's written. And he has an upcoming book that you see now live on this on the live stream here. The end of everything. And Victor, why don't we start with that? That's the, yeah. that's, I have not, this is the first time I've seen the cover. Tell us what's, yeah, uh, I, when's, I, when's it coming out? I got the uh, proof today, the galley proof. Uh, it comes out, I'm I'm doing the final check on the, so I know what it looks like now. It's printed as a book. Uh, May 7th is the, is the rollout date. And it's, um, I wrote it, you know, before the Hamas situation, but it's, kind of a warning that there are vulnerable peoples all around the world across time and space and they get into wars that they don't think will be existential and existential defined as the elimination of their society or civilization but it happens sometimes and so I want to I try to look at case studies ancient Thebes at Alexander the Great attacked but then destroyed utterly and I mean utterly. And same thing with Scipio Aemilianus when he destroyed Carthage in 146, leveled the city, enslaved the surviving population, killed off most people. And then I don't think he salted the earth as pro the proverbial story went, but he, he made it uninhabitable. And I looked at Constantinople where they destroyed the Byzantine Christian civilization in Asia, the, the Ottomans did, but they kept the infrastructure and then kind of like a DNA virus took it over. And then finally, the Cortez's destruction of Tenochtitlan, Aztec, Mexico City. And he leveled that city down to the ground and killed or enslaved most of the Aztecs. And they ceased to exist. And so, and then I, I, and I talk about what, what is defined as, you know, destruction, does the language continue in some places, et cetera. But I have a very long epilogue where I take that information and say, could this happen again? And why does it happen? And I give kind of a typology that people are very naive. They think help is going to be on the way. They, they miscalculate their forces versus the others. They don't believe people when they say they're going to annihilate them. I have a whole list of commonalities in those four examples. And then I look at, in the, I look at Israel, uh, the Armenians, the Greeks, the Kurds, people like that that are surrounded. I talk about Ukraine and threats to of Putin, that they're surrounded in the case of Greece, Israel, the Kurds, and uh, Armenia. They're surrounded by hostile neighbors, and they have small populations. Uh, and they've been threat uh, just in the last, since the book has been written, Mr. Erdogan has threatened to send missiles uh, into Athens. He's threatened to wipe out the Armenians over disputed territory. And of course, Iran keeps talking about getting a bomb. And then in the past, they've called Israel a one bomb state. So it's kind of well, a warning. And it turned out to be pretty timely given what we see in the Middle East right now. So I think this is also timely, Victor, and it's unfortunate, but the title, The End of Everything, and being that this is a year in review of all the crazy things that have happened in this past year, nothing was crazier in my mind what the Colorado Supreme Court just did. You want to yeah. talk the end of everything. Uh, this is the end of everything if uh, courts uh, now can decide to be the basically the, the executioner to the convictor to the... Uh, to no trial, to uh, convicting Donald Trump and kicking him off the ballot. Um, look, I I think this has uh, comparisons to some of the, you know, some of the decisions that led up to the Civil War. Um, if this can happen, because if this is true, um, then and you already saw our our beautiful state, California, uh, they now want to do it. The Lieutenant Governor of California now wants the Secretary of State in California to do the same thing. So. This is a slippery slope, 
And I think that book, yeah. everything, um, it's too bad you couldn't put this in the epilogue, but I'd like to get your thoughts on it, on it because I think it is the well, biggest thing of the year. Here in California, Miss Kunalakas, she, she couldn't even read the statue right. She got the age wrong and everything. When you look at the statue, you see how specific it is to the Civil War. And it actually doesn't say that if you're president, you're, you're subject to the statute. It talks about people who are electors or, or other elected officials. But basically, it said all of those people who had been federal officials who joined the succession and fought violently against the Union could not return to their former status after 1865 unless two thirds of the Congress exempted them. So it doesn't have anything to do with Donald Trump. And if he did, I mean, if you're an insurrectionist, Devin, you don't say uh, assemble peacefully and patriotically at the Capitol and you don't have right. everybody there completely unarmed. And if you're anti-insurrectionist and you really think it's an insurrection, then you brag about how many FBI people were there and you're transparent about the actual number of people who died and the circumstances. And when you have a, a January 6th committee, you make it open to everybody to expose the insurrection. But if you're lying about it, or you've said that you don't, you deliberately didn't want to beef up security, or there were a lot of FBI informants that you don't want to talk about, then you do what, what's happened. So it wasn't an insurrection and even, even if you thought it was, then you try Donald Trump. He's never been charged with insurrection. He's never been tried. And that was a reason for it. Most prosecutors on the federal level knew it, would, it was ridiculous. Another thing is, if you're going to talk about insurrection in terms of threatening violence uh, on a mass scale that endangers the government, or in terms of trying to undermine election, the left has all sorts of culpability. In 2020, in June, Kamala Harris, who was just about ready to be nominated, said that these violent protests, she said they should continue. They will continue. They'll go all the way to the election. You can't stop right. it. And then we had you, a former colleague of yours in Congress, uh, Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, got right out in front of the Supreme Court and said, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, you sowed the wind, you, you're going to reap the whirlwind. And more importantly, he said, you're not going to know what hit you, hit you. Uh, maybe uh, you could say that maybe Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, Wyoming, Utah could say, well, you know, Joe Biden violated the oath of office by letting in 8 million people illegally residing, illegally destroyed federal immigration. These in the last statute that you quoted on Section three says, or give aid, basically help the enemies of the United States. You could say that the Mexican government and people who are facilitating the cartels, he's given aid to. So there's so many things. And I think ultimately they knew that Colorado would not be determinative to the Trump strategy, but they, they wanted to start there because they thought two things, it would create momentum and people say, wow, we want to be, we want to outdo Colorado. We're going to get in on this. And that, I think that was correct that that worked. And then the second is, if he's not on the ballot uh, in the primary, there's a good chance he won't be on the ballot in the general if it's upheld. And then the down ticket, one third of the candidates in the Senate and all of the House members are going to be on the conservative side at a disadvantage if their party leader's not on the ballot. So it's a long-term strategic gambit and they can't, the Supreme Court can't allow it to stand because if it does, it's going to be a cycle of tit for tat and unwind the country. And it's predicated, as you know, from Russian collusion, laptop disinformation, two impeachments for the first time, trying Trump as a private citizen, raiding his home. They do all these unprecedented things on the assumption that nobody would do that to them. In other words, the Republicans play by the Marcus at Queensbury rules. And, and when they even give a hint that they are like an impeachment inquiry, they go ballistic. They can't yeah. take it. And well, I'm, so I'm it, watching, it's... I'm watching for two things to happen right now. And that is that one, let's talk about the Republicans because you brought it up. So uh, it's your right to be a never Trump Republican. Um, that's I have no issue with that if you don't want to vote for Donald Trump. But 
you have a responsibility as a Republican leader to say, and I think they should have been saying it all along with all of these multiple indictments that have come out. They should have been strong against it, and they have not. Many have not been. Um, yeah. But this, this just you know threw everything out the window. If you are now a Republican leader and you have not spoke out against this, um, I don't know how you can be in Republican leadership. Um, I think the RNC should be very clear about this. All the Republican leadership should be clear about this. Uh, and if you're not, it's to your point, Marcus of Queensbury, or or you're just weak and you're scared of the fake news mafia that exists in D.C. That, and I get it uh, because I've been a, a you know a attacked by these fools for for many many years, um, and it takes guts and it takes stamina and it takes perseverance. But you know if you're headed to Washington right now, and you're going to be an elected official, you better be ready for that. And you know I still uh, you know I'm frustrated by so many of my colleagues that will go on these fake news networks which I've said this for many years, I, I would tell them in these you know, closed door meetings and even publicly, I said, when I would say, why are you talking to these fake news outlets that are working for the Democrats? They're just prop or, or billionaires that are working with the Democrats. And I said, would you walk into the DNC with an army of lawyers and sit down for a deposition? And I'm sort of, oh no, of course I wouldn't do that. Well, you're doing the same thing. You're doing the same thing when you are going on to these networks and participating uh, in this. And I, and look, if we had a real press in this country, real media, none of what we're seeing right now would would be happening. But unfortunately, we do not. We have a we have a media that is controlled by the left. It's just a propaganda arm. And I think what happens, Victor, is that they're scared. The second point I would make, and have you and, and just have you follow up, what I'm going to be watching for here in the next couple of weeks is going to be. The Supreme Court, not only should it be nine to zero, that's going to be an important thing, important data point. The other data point is going to be is what do, if it's nine zero, what do they say? You know, yeah, because I don't think it's going to be Supreme Court can step in. They need to step in now and they need to step in and, and put this fire out. The country is on fire. It's being torn apart. The Supreme Court could stand up right now and really slam. Uh, this down, but you, I just kind of heard you say, you don't think it'll be nine zero. Oh, I don't think Kajanji Brown will vote for her. she, she will be one. I think maybe Kagan will join the five um, or five or six, six, maybe. Uh, so you might get seven to two or eight to one, but there will be people who will try to uphold this. The, uh, I, I, I have a bad habit of just surveying what the left says. And when I look at MSNBC and CNN, they're giddy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so is the DNC. They're giddy. They don't realize that they're playing with fire. They just keep doing this. And you notice that all of a sudden, when you were in the investigatory role on the House Select Intelligence Committee, they idolized so-called whistleblowers, Eric Saramella and Ben Men. And now all of a sudden the IRS whistleblowers, whistleblowers are horrible people. They're traitors. Uh, they, yeah. they said that it was terrible uh, when they subpoenaed, excuse me, when they subpoenaed Ivanka and Jared Kushner uh, for the January 6th committee, or they brought in the Trump boys on the Lakita James matter under subpoena. The left thought that was wonderful. Now all of a sudden they said, this is horrible. How dare you subpoena a presidential son. Same thing with the impeachment in the first term of a president. They did that twice to Donald Trump. They said this is a necessary corrective to unconstitutional behavior. And suddenly, how can you dare impeach a president when he loses the majority? This is what the founders were afraid of. So that fluidity shows you that you can't trust them at all. You, you can't deal with them. You can't uh, negotiate with them. Because these aren't Democrats. These are not Uber Humphrey, JFK. They're not even Bill Clinton. I don't even think they're progressives like Obama anymore. I think they're hardcore socialists. I think that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and a radicalized and bitter Michelle and Barack and maybe the squad are running things. And they want yeah, well, to destroy, well, they there's want no to destroy your institution. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I know this. I have an intricate knowledge of it. I mean, Obama is running the Justice Department. Yeah. Him and his people yes. are running the Justice and Department. And the appointments. I think the, all the judicial appointments have to come through him. Yeah. And uh, they, 
it's not any more left or right. It's civilization against nihilism. I mean, when you were in Congress, when you went there, if you had a dispute about the border, the left would try to introduce legislation to liberalize the border. Or they are, if there was a dispute about federal crime policies, the liberal judges versus the conservative, but nobody then thought they were going to blow up the entire border and let 8 million people in. Right. Nobody then thought we're going to decriminalize most some felonies and let out violent felons the same day, like these Soros prosecutor. And they, even in the energy debate, it was, well, 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 maybe natural gas is okay as we transition to wind and solar. Nobody 10, 15 years ago said, we're going to ban natural gas stove. We're going to mandate electric vehicles. This new left is crazy and they want to destroy the existing fabric of our country and then rebuild it in their image. So it's it's new. As I, th I think it's it's le reached a level, a level and, and we can see it with this uh, Colorado ruling. We're speaking to uh, Victor Davis Hanson. You can follow him on True Social. And uh, Victor, your book, we're going to get into the year in review, but we had to talk about this issue. Uh, but your book is going to be available on May 7th. Um, it's uh, called The End of Everything. Can you, is it available for pre-order now? Yeah, it is. It's doing very well. You can order it either directly through ha at Basic Books. I have that on my website, victorhanson.com. Or you can go to Amazon and you can pre-order it. Or you can go to your local bookstore and pre-order it. So it's doing pretty well. It's got a lot of pre-orders. Victorhanson.com? Yes. VictorHanson.com. You can go there, uh, bypass the big tech tyrants. You can go there. And, and I should say, Victor, I'm going to, you know, now we're starting, uh, uh, everybody's on Rumble. We're live streaming now. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. If you're listening to this this later, thank you. Also, don't forget, if you're listening to this later, don't forget to go pay homage to the Apple gods or wherever you listen to your podcast at. Make sure you, make sure you rate it. Uh, we will. We put up uh, a lot of the ratings up there. Uh, and anyways, Victor, we're going to, we're going to go right into, uh, we've got a lot to cover here, but I want to get your comment on Donald Trump and, uh, his situation in New York has been a big story. One of the first cases that have been prosecuted also very unprecedented. Uh, but let's uh, play that uh, now. So this rogue judge refuses to acknowledge the fact that we won 80% of this case in the appellate division, including statute of limitations. You know, in the statute of limitations, you have a period of time. He wants to go back so far that nobody's ever even heard of such a ridiculous thing. So we won the case in the appellate division, and this judge refuses to acknowledge the appellate division, meaning he's got contempt for his own court system. Nobody's ever seen that before, where he refuses to even talk about it or acknowledge it. And the attorney general is a total corrupt, she's a corrupt person, a terrible person, driving people out of New York. So I think that's exactly right. Driving people out of New York. That was a key statement that the president, President Trump just said there. Um, New York, Victor, long been the financial center of the world case law that goes back two centuries. Um, Victor, I, I mean, look, I, I just don't know if I'm if I'm a business in New York, and I'm sure if, if Donald Trump had his, had his wishes, um, I don't know who would want to be in New York, who would want to start a business there. Um, but this is a, a new precedent. And once again, where's the Chamber of Commerce? Where's all the business groups? Where's the business lawyers? Where's the, you know, from the, the, the stock exchange, Wall Street, they should all be in unison saying, look, we may not vote for Donald Trump, but this has to end. And, and this is the problem here. When, when good men, women don't do anything and don't stand up, like they're not standing up in the financial center of the world, this is crazy. And Victor, you know this, you've been in business for yourself, as have I. Uh, you know you're dealing with very sophisticated banks. They don't give a damn about what you put on uh, your financial disclosures. They could care less. The only reason, the purpose they have that is, is because you have a duty and obligation to say, to list all of your assets so that the bank can then come after you if you don't pay your loan back. They don't use this for the loan. It's pure, utter nonsense and has been from the from the very beginning. And it's, you know, the whole thing is preposterous. You and I have both been, been at Mar-a-Lago. Um, you know, you know the, the whole idea that, that that property is worth $18 million is 
is a joke. It's one of the most uh, prized properties on the whole planet in one of the most expensive real estate areas on the planet. But what say yeah. you? Well, I was interested in that because I had to speak for six days two weeks ago in Palm Beach to various entities. So one person who was very prominent and knowledgeable of uh, Palm Beach, he was driving me and I just happened to ask him, how about that place? How about that place that was on the water? And these were maybe a quarter acre lots. And he would say 80 million, 90 million, 120 million. Yeah. And then I said, but how about that place? And we went by Mar Lago. And he said, that place, it has water on both sides. It's 17 acres. It's got a historic cachet. It, he said anywhere from 700 million to 900 million, maybe even a billion. So everybody in Palm Beach knows that. And we, everybody, you know, I used to get loans from the Federal Land Bank where they would, you'd have to put up your assets, very small compared to most businessmen. But I once talked to the loan officer and he came out and they came out and looked at what I had said it was worth, the land, the houses, the building, the equipment. And he said, you know, <laughs> you're pretty accurate. And I said, what do you mean I'm pretty accurate? And he said, nobody, nobody that I've seen uh, is going to take the trouble to get the exact. They give me a rough estimate and they I have to downgrade it, but it's just informal. And what I'm more interested in is your financial history. Have you ever defaulted on a loan? Have you ever misled a bank in an egregious fashion? And in this case, everybody admits that the banks were pretty savvy. They loaned Donald Trump the money. Donald Trump paid the money back. The banks made a hefty profit on the interest that they charged him. And this has never been, an, this statute has never been used against any business person in New York and they know it. So that begs the question, why are they doing this? Why does Latita James do this? Why does Alvin Bragg do this? Why does Fannie Willis do it? And the answer is they told us in advance when they're running for office and when they fundraise that they're gonna go out and get Donald Trump, any means necessary, any possible mechanism they can employ. And that's what they're doing. And they, it's all predicated on one assumption, Devin, that they're going to try these cases, all four of them, in big cities, Atlanta, Washington, New York, Miami. And they're going to they're gonna have left-wing prosecutors, and they're going to get left-wing judges, and they think they're going to have left-wing juries, and they're going to nullify the evidence. So if the Trump lawyers come in and say, this is ridiculous, here it is the prosecutor will make some extraneous argument that Donald Trump is a prince of darkness and he hates you, he's racist, he's sexist, he's xenophobic, and that will persuade the jury and the judge will punish him and the judge will be famous and get media acclaim. That's what it's all about. It has nothing to do with the merits of the case. If it did have anything merits of the case, they would have indicted Barbara Boxer in 2004 when she tried to delay the electors in Ohio and sabotage uh, George W. Bush's successful uh, re-election, or they would have rounded up the DNC people who organized that C list of celebrities in 2016 under Martin Sheen, who, who night after night got on TV and they begged people. They said, call the electors up. Here they are. They're going to be faithless electors. They're not going to reflect the popular vote in their state that Donald Trump won. They're going to defect over... Uh, to Hillary Clinton. That was a way to sabotage the Electoral College. Nobody said a word. And Jill Stein sued, as you remember, the, the, the voting machines and tried to overturn the election. And then when the election was over with, Hillary Clinton, as well as the late Jim, uh, as well as Jimmy Carter said, this is an illegitimate president. He didn't win. They, so, and we're joining the resistance in the case of Hillary. So yep. election denialism, uh, trying to stop a, a transparent victory by a candidate. We don't even have to get in. You're the expert on the 2016 Clinton D, DNC, Perkins Coe, fusing G, GPS paywalls that yeah. tried, to destroy, tried to destroy a political campaign. Well, if anything, it was an insurrection. I mean, that's where the, maybe the law should have applied was that whole scheme by the DNC and the Clintons and our own DOJ and FBI. They'd have to, yeah. I've long said this, this was always the problem. Uh, they should have prosecuted themselves for a whole number of crimes because you're yeah, exactly should've. right. They tried. I mean, the whole Mueller hoax uh, on the Russia hoax was a a 
an investigation in search of a crime. I think my listeners have heard me say this many times, but you know, Mueller walked in the door that day. If you remember, I was the one who had con you know consistently said, you know, the only thing that we know that was illegal here is illegal leaks from DOJ and FBI. Outside of that, me as the intelligence committee chairman had not seen anything to do with Russia. So when Mueller walks in the door, uh, he looks around to Weissman and these other jackasses and says, okay, boys, where, you know, give us the Russians today. Let's go. Show me the Russians. Oh, sorry, Bob. We don't have any evidence here, um, but uh, we've been making it all up. And, and Mueller's a scumbag too, right? I mean, he should have- Well, I mean, he, he testified. Over, over, yeah. he, he looked right at the, he looked at you guys while he was under oath. And the whole reason to be, the whole catalyst that he got that special counsel appointment was the steel dossier and the nefarious activities of Fusion GPS. And I think, I don't know right. if it was you or one of your colleagues said, would you tell us about Fusion GPS? Would you tell us about the steel? He said he didn't know anything about them. I don't know right. anything about them. And the he investigation, played, your point yeah, is, yeah. and we uncovered that the investigation was predicated on mm -hmm. the information from the steel dossier. Yeah. That was what it was in the warrant. So he knew like you walk in the door, any, you and I have never been a prosecutor, Victor, but you walk in the door, you say, okay, what are we actually looking at? Give us the predicate of the case. That's how it begins. And Mueller should have, if he had, you know, he's a he's a nasty guy. He's going to go down in history as a real, a lot of scumbags, but he's one of the ones at the highest level. And, and it's because of the Russia hoax. I think before that, I think he would have, he should have just dripped well, he off. Had, he, he has a lot fine. of call it. He has a lot of company because he would. He was the FBI director who was succeeded by James Comey, who also to your committee on 245 occasions under oath said he couldn't remember things that he'd actually talked about in depth before. Then he was su succeeded by Andrew McCabe, who admitted that he lied four times to a federal investigator, who then the fourth guy in the sequence, Christopher Ray. He was the one that said, I can't answer anything. I got an appointment and he got in a private Gulfstream and flew to his uh, vacation home and he can't tell us the truth about how many fbi informants there were in january 6 even though matthew rosenberg the pulitzer prize winning expert liberal from new york times says it was just kind of a fun lark i went out there and there were fbi informants everywhere and our all our guys and the and the times were just they were all wounded fawns they made a big thing it was just kind of a gala it was just a bunch of buffoonish stuff and and he said that. And then when they asked Ray about that, he wouldn't comment. He won't tell anybody. Right, right. Which means they had informants. We still have yeah. the problems with January 6th. So we're doing a year in re review with Victor Davis Hanson. Victor, on your podcast, you talk a lot about how we got to this point. And you've spent your whole life, uh, not only in farming, but also in education. Um, you're at the Hoover Institute. You deal, you're right in the hotbed of, of, of liberalism there. You've long been warning that the schools, the education that kids are getting is being downgraded quickly. And so when you ask yourselves, where are these Jack Smith and Fannie Willis, where are these guys all coming from? Well, they're coming out of the most prized institute, educational institutions in this country. But this year, Victor, you want to talk about the end of everything. Uh, this was it. I want to play another video for you uh, because I think one of the most um, illustrative congressional hearings, normally people go before a congressional hearing, blah, blah, blah. They don't say anything. Nothing happens. But you have these very highly educated woke wackos that are running pres presidents. One got fired um, of the of the three or four. One from Harvard did not get fired. But let's watch uh, my former colleague, Elise Stefanik, uh, question uh, the college president. Ms. McGill, at Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment, yes. I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. So is your if testimony it, that it, you will not answer yes? If it uh, is, if the, yes becomes, no. if the speech becomes conduct, 
it can be harassment, yes. Conduct meaning committing the act of genocide? The speech is not harassment? This is unacceptable, Ms. McGill. I'm gonna give you one more opportunity for the world to see your answer. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's code of conduct when it comes to bullying and harassment? Yes or no? It can be harassment. The answer is yes. <laughs> so, Victor, um, that was one of the biggest takedowns. Uh, that university president ended up uh, being fired or let go. The others uh, have survived. Um, I think it's incredible with the amount of money that they would spend on PR people. So when you go testify before Congress, these, these government institutions, these universities, they have entire offices, armies of lobbyists and PR people that not only are located uh, at the university itself, but they also have offices within Washington, D.C. Yes, they had Washington legal teams. Outside Whole legal contractors. teams, armies of lawyers, contractors, all the best. But I where mean, did what? they come from, Devin? They came from the same schools. <laughs> the same schools. So anyway, yeah, I, I, I follow, yeah, I followed Liz McGill. She was the dean of law school at Stanford. I have an apartment on campus, so I have to walk through the law school to get to my office. So I've watched her and I can tell you without any passion or anger that what she said was not true. She and everybody at Stanford University, if you say that you're calling for the destruction or you want to kill blacks, Latinos, gays, trans, women, anybody other than Jews or white males, you're going to be expelled. And that has happened for hate speech. They call it hate speech. Sure. She knows that. So she went up there and flat out lied. There is no context uh, at Stanford or the Ivy League when you want to say something uh, derogatory about a collective group of people. They will expel you or they'll chastise you, or they'll spin you, or they'll put you on leave. That's just a fact. Or if you're applying to Harvard or Stanford, they go through your social media after you're accepted. And if they find anything the 17-year-old kid said that was derogatory about an entire group, they will withdraw that, admis that admissions officer. The next thing was that was so weird about it, uh, all of them should have been fired. We saw why she should have been, but the MIT, Ms. Kornblut, she said that Palestinian pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian students who had harassed, not just verbally, but physically, Jewish students were in violation of MIT's code of conduct, but she couldn't really prosecute them or bring them to heel because if she did, they might lose their student visas and they would have to go back where they came from, which I think most people would prefer since they abused the hospitality of their host. And then we had Miss Gay, and I remember her too because I was on campus uh, when she was a professor at Stanford in the political science department. It was a very uh, contentious and uh, controversial case. She came up for tenure, and she had been a Stanford undergraduate, went to Harvard, came back, and I, I've been, for 10 years, I was on the California State University Fresno campus on the promotion tenured. And, you know, we're a third, what people call us a third tier school, UC and then the private. And we're, but we had higher standards than Stanford did in her case because we would have not tenured her at any Cal State campus. She had four articles and they were pretty mediocre and they were not scholarly. And we now know that half of them were plagiarized. But they gave her tenure. And I remember at the time people saying, if she gets tenure, then we have no ability to fire anybody. And so she is now, since her testimony, we've got further, uh, we've got further evidence that she's a plagiarist. So now that the president of Harvard is a, a plagiarist, we had a, a president at Stanford who 30 years ago, Devin, may or may not have, it was controversial, enhanced illustration on a co-authored scientific article that might have overly emphasized the results. And guess what? They forced him to resign for that infraction. And it was nothing compared to her. So now when you look at those three blind mice and they're blind to the reality, uh, it's pretty clear 
that if you're Jewish, you should not go to those schools. The Jewish enrollments dropped from 30% in the 70s uh, with the abolition of the SAT, the abolition of ranked uh, high school GPAs. It's down to about 10%, and it's going to fall further. And that's a lot of the subtext of what's going on. There's hundreds of thousands of Middle East full tuition students are being recruited with Gulf oil money, big gifts to Middle uh, Eastern programs at Columbia, Stanford, Harvard, Yale from the Middle East, and very few Jewish students. And under the new repertory admissions at Stanford, the incoming class is 20% white. So what they didn't tell you is every one of those persons had a little calculus in their mind that said, I'm willing to lie in front of the world because there's nobody at my campus who will get angry about that lie. But if I come out and say river to the sea or kill the Jews is an actionable offense, then I got to deal with a whole faculty. I got to deal with a whole administration that are woke, DEI, pro Hamas. And I'm not going to do that because I'll be finished. I can lie to the world and I can be anti-Semitic. There's going to be no consequences. But if I if I take on the Middle East student lobby and the DEI group and my own left wing faculty, I'm done for. So that's what they were doing. Yeah, and, w- and from the river of the sea, as soon as that came out, they started that chant. And I think this went viral on TikTok. I think the Chinese Communist Party pushed this to our young people under the age yeah. of 25, Victor. But you know, I can tell you that. Um, you know, right after that, I said, well, most of these kids don't even know where Israel is to have no they clue don't. about what Palestinian is, where the Gaza Strip is, couldn't find it on a map, the Gaza Strip uh, or um, uh, or the other Palestinian territories, uh, the West Bank. Um, but I think more so they're out chanting river to the sea, Victor, in your estimation, do you think those kids and I'm being a little bit sarcastic here, but what percentage of these kids under the age of 25? Um, that are singing River to the Sea, do they know, A, where the Gaza Strip is, B, what river are they talking about, and could they name what sea it is on their first choice? Well, we don't have to speculate because a UC uh, UC Berkeley professor did a survey, I think, of 1,200 students, and he asked that question. Half of them, half of the people in the university did not know where or much less what the Jordan River was. And they didn't, they answered things like Atlantic Ocean. They didn't understand where the Mediterranean was. And uh, as I say, when I walk to campus, we have a Gazan, a Gaza Strip in the middle of Stanford. It's a group of, got a little fence around it and there's tents where people are living and they hand out, they give lectures, they hand out, uh, and then there's a rival one from Israel. But as I was walking across campus in October and November, students congregate around them. And so when they, they, some of the students, not necessarily the Middle Eastern students, they'll come up to you as you walk by and say, hey, you wanna support? And so I, I always talk to them as I'm walking and I ask one of them, what do you wanna do? What does river to the sea mean? Because, well, we're gonna get rid of Israel. And in fact, a, a recent poll, as you saw, said 50% of young people in that category 18 to 25 want to get rid of Israel and give it to them off. But I asked them, what would happen? What do you mean? Do you understand that it means to destroy Israel? She said, yeah, they'll have to go home. And I said, where do they go? She goes, well, wherever they were born. I said, most of them were born, almost all of them had been born in Israel and some for 3000 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then she said, well, they have to leave. And I said, well, you know, 21% of the Israeli population is Arabic. No, I didn't know that. What happened to them? They're Israelis. Oh, really? 21%? I said, yes. Well, they can stay. So I said, you just told me you're not anti-Semitic. You're just anti-Israeli. So all the Jewish Israelis are going to be exterminated, and you're going to turn over the land to Hamas and the 21% Israelis who don't happen to be Jewish. And she said, yeah. So, And this wasn't a Middle Eastern student. This was just a useful idiot Stanford elite student. And so this, uh, you know, Devin, if we're in the third year of post George Floyd admission, and before that we had affirmative action that was demographically adjusted. By that, I mean, if there's 12% blacks in the general population, 12% get in Latinos, except for Asians in which we had racial discrimination because they, they performed too well in, in the eyes of the admissions officer. But now at Stanford, we have 20% of the incoming class is white. And so uh, 
doesn't have anything to do with race, but when you abolish the SAT and you abolish the ranking, so where I went to school at Selma High School, I can tell you it was not competitive with Palo Alto High School when I went to college, but it is now if because they don't rank them. And so my point is they have no way to adjudicate talent that goes into these universities, which they said, not you, not me, they said it's important for us to be preeminent 10 years ago. They used to tell you, you can't get into Harvard unless you have 780 on the SAT. You have to have a 4.5. You have to write a brilliant essay. That's all out the window. Mm -hmm. Guy like yeah, got in Stanford for that. I mean, what, yeah, he got in Stanford for writing Black Lives Matter 100 and what, and what's happened, Victor, is that essentially what they're doing is if you have, as long as you have over a 4.0 in high school, um, then they're going to look at what race you are and and what activities you're in and what you say in your application and i mean it's it's impossible because when you say 20 percent white victor i mean that's that's really that's uh, that's on the high side when you talk about white males it must be well, that's about nine percent white white males are about nine percent of stanford yeah. and so the result is, that, but that's not the end of it. That's the beginning. So once you bring all these students in who have not taken the SAT and don't have co competitive GPAs and are, according to your rules, again, not my rules, not yours, but according to what your curriculum and your faculty expected just five years ago to make sure your institution was world famous and turned out these brilliant potential lawyers and doctors and CEOs and et cetera, then what do you do? And I can tell you what you do because I see it every day. You have about three or four choices, Devin. You either bring in new classes, Latinx, Latinx sexuality or Marvel comic books, anything with a dash, studies, studies in comic books, peace studies, race studies, gender studies. Or you take your existing class, say history of Western philosophy, instead of having nine authors, you have two. Or you yesterday's D is today's B. 80% now at Yale get, get A's. So you have to water down grades or content or make new courses. And if you don't do that and you stick to a competitive curricula and the same workload and the same grading, guess what happens? You give too many D's and C's and then who do you, who do you come in contact with? The DEI czar. And the DEI czar calls you up and says, you know, you have a systematic pattern of giving lower grades to people who are marginalized. And I looked at your syllabus. It's very ethnocentric white, and it has uh, it has a colonial settler tinge, and you have not filled out your diversity statement. And that's what they do. And so they've scared the faculty. And I don't know how it's all going to end, but if it keeps up another year or two, Harvard and Yale and Stanford are going to be like Bud Light or Disney or Target. They're going to destroy their brand. And even the early admissions yeah. applications to Harvard are down 20, 17 percent, 18 percent. Why would yeah. you want to go well, there? I don't, look, I don't think it's not safe we, if we you're know, Jewish. We know one thing. The only thing that stops the left is hardcore deterrence where they feel pain. Yes. And I can tell you, they don't feel pain right now. They think they're winning. And, but you know, the, the truth is, I think you probably know this around here with a lot of people that, uh, and I say this, I'm in, I'm in California, just a few miles away from Victor's farm uh, today. Um, but you can tell in the, even in this region, a lot of the, my, I have a lot of friends now that have kids that are going to college, Victor, they don't even apply to many of the university. I mean, like UC Davis, no, like all the ag kids, this is an ag, we're in the ag Mecca here. I mean, Everybody knows that yeah. breadbasket of the solar system, I like to call it. Victor, I don't know any kids. I mean, I'd say, um, and, and I'm sure there's some that I do, but all of my friends' kids, they're not going to UC Davis. Um, I know. You, I mean, UC Davis the, is one of the hotbeds of anti Semitism. It's yeah, faculty and, was. They had a UC Davis even, professor that said that all kinds of crazy things. Yeah. And even I mean, I, so, you have that historic, I mean, God, they're called the UC Davis Aggies. That's their name, right? So they're not going there. Even I'm shocked at, yeah. you know, I was a graduate of of, of Cal Poly the, in agriculture there. And um, I'm so shocked at the number of kids that I know uh, that are, because of all this, this wokeness, um, they are now 
going to Oklahoma and Texas seems to be a big uh, region that they're going to. I must have you know two dozen young people that I know that have went either there or some of, or they're going to smaller universities um, in the uh, uh, I, you know places like well, Wyoming. I can um, yeah, yeah. I, I can tell you I teach at Hillsdale every fall and they have quadrupled their admission. They're they're just swamped, and I'm not talking about everybody applying they're getting thousands of people who went to harvard princeton yale that are applying to hillsdale college and the same thing is true of pepperdine st thomas aquinas college on the private side and it, it's mm -hmm. if if the house republicans had said at the end of those testimonies after hearing this today when we get, we gain the Senate and the White House, the only thing you people are going to understand if we tax your endowment income, you guys discussed that when you, in 2017 in the House, and mm -hmm. yep. we're going to look very carefully about giving you these billions of dollars of federal research money when you don't follow the Constitution, due process and stuff like that. And more importantly, we're going to get the government out of the student loan business and I think they would have clicked their heels and said, please, please do not do that. They wouldn't, able, they wouldn't have, be able to hire one DEI czar. They wouldn't have the cash. And they're terrified. If they just said to them, President Gay, Harvard's got a $50 billion endowment. You get $3 billion a year. Just pay taxes on it. And by the way, you get seven, $800 million a year in research. Just make sure that the faculty that is getting that money in their own classes follows the Constitution. Oh, and by the way, you have 50 billion. You use that as insurance against your own student loans, but do not ask the government where half the people in the country don't go to college to subsidize these often 30% are in default. Also trade schools, Devin, you see so many people. Uh, I've been remodeling my house over two years. And when I see people come out here that are plumbers, electricians, roofers, sheetrockers, painters, Young people, they're making $25 an hour, $30 an hour. They're, they're very bright. They're happy. Uh, I notice one thing that they have families and they get married in their 20s. When I go to Stanford or I go speak at other universities, the, the kids, they're unhappy. They're not that bright anymore. They're not well-educated. They're not going to get married, buy a house, have children until their 30s, if at all. Uh, prolonged adolescence and... Uh, Universities broke their word. They told us after World War II, we're going to have a general education that teaches civics, unites the countries, instills a generation with the tools of American government and custom tradition. And we're going to be so competitive that our graduates will stock the PhD programs, the MA, the JD, the M and they're going to be the world's top experts. And everybody in the, and that was pretty true from 1945 oh, to about 1985. But they broke the bargain. The general education is a prescription that a student will uh, graduate ignorant and their professional schools are, ideo are ideologically warped. If you said to these presidents, okay, take, a, take the SAT out. But, you know, when you go to law school, you don't become a lawyer. You have, still have to pass the bar. So everybody who gets a BA in the United States has to take the SAT as an exit exam. And maybe you should get maybe just 550, 80th percentile. They would go berserk because they know that the way that these kids are being trained, that they would flunk flunk all of those tests. Yeah. We're talking to Victor Davis Hansen. And Victor, there's a couple more questions I want to get through uh, today for the yeah. live stream. If you're listening to this later, you can follow Victor Davis Hansen. Uh, he has his own podcast, the Victor Davis Hansen show that you can get uh, anywhere you get your podcast. But he, I, I'm glad we were able to cover this in this year in review, Victor, because I've listened to you talk about this on your podcast for so many, so many years. So thank you for for bringing this up because it is one of the big issues of the year, and I think it's a trend that's going in the in in the wrong direction. Uh, Victor, we've talked a lot about um, uh, the border in here. I don't I don't think we we need to get into that um, too much because we've kind of covered it already. Uh, but I do. There's a couple more issues that I want to get to, and most notably. We had uh, uh, the journalist, Michael Schellenberger, who the left now has totally disowned as being a real journalist, but he testified to Congress about these, the censorship industrial complex 
And I want to play that video here and then get your comment on the censorship that's been occurring that we now know about uh, over the course of this past year. It is important to understand how these groups function. They are not publicly engaging with their opponents in an open exchange of ideas. They aren't asking for a national debate over the limits of the First Amendment. Rather, they are creating blacklists of disfavored people and then pressuring, cajoling, and demanding that social media platforms censor, deamplify, and even ban the people on those lists. The censorship industrial complex combines established methods of psychological manipulation, some developed by the US military during the global war on terror, with highly sophisticated tools from computer science, including artificial intelligence. The complex's leaders are driven by the fear that the internet and social media platforms empower populist, alternative, and fringe personalities and views which they regard as destabilizing. Federal government officials, agencies, and contractors have gone from fighting ISIS recruiters and Russian bots to censoring and deplatforming ordinary Americans and disfavored public figures. Importantly, the bar for bringing in military-grade government monitoring and speech countering techniques has moved from, quote, countering terrorism to, quote, countering extremism to countering simple misinformation, otherwise known as being wrong on the internet. The government no longer needs a predicate of calling you a terrorist or an extremist to deploy government resources to counter your political activity. The only predicate it needs is simply the assertion that the opinion you expressed on social media is wrong. Victor, I think uh, Michael Schellenberger really, that was uh, really summed it up well. Here at True Social, uh, we don't do that. In fact, that's why I left Congress, Victor, because I was one of the first ones to be shadow banned. Uh, I think I was the first congressman to actually catch them shadow banning me, which means it's a different form of censorship. Uh, essentially means that if you go and try to find me on YouTube or Twitter or what have you, you weren't able to see uh, my posts. Um, a lot of this uh, censorship has continued. Um, it's why True Social exists. And and the and the other point that I would make is that you know I don't let my kids onto TikTok or Instagram or some of these other platforms, but I do allow them to be on on True Social. So um, if you have kids, the True Social is a good place, family friendly. We don't allow all the illegal activity, and we also don't uh, we don't shadow ban. Uh, but Victor, you've covered this a lot. Um, what do you think about this, about Schellenberger and the points that he made there before Congress this year? Well, he was absolutely right. And I think if you and I had this discussion, I don't know, four years ago, and I said, hey, Devin, I have a hunch that uh, the FBI and James Baker, the general counsel, they're hiring at $3 million a year uh, Jack Dorsey's Twitter to suppress information that's going to affect a national debate and try to ensure that Donald Trump's not elected in 2020 by spreading the disinformation that the laptop uh, is actually a Russian disinformation. I don't, nobody would believe that, that the FBI was hiring and Facebook as well, but they are. And I'm not a good person to talk about this because, you know, Stanford had the Stanford Internet Observatory, uh, which uh, was involved in suppression of free speech on the Internet. And then we also had a list uh, of approved uh, words that we as faculty and staff could use. And, and some of the taboo, taboo words were immigrant, patriotic, American, et cetera. We can't use those words supposedly. That went on. That was in the Wall Street Journal. Pick that up. And then, you know, in 2020 and 21, uh, the Stanford Faculty Senate went after Scott Atlas and myself. Mm -hmm. Scott was everything that Scott said, as you know, about the quarantine, that it was going to be counterproductive, economic damage, higher rates of cancer and diseases from missed uh, medical screenings and, and surgeries, spousal abuse, suicide. All that turned out to be true. Mm -hmm. And nonetheless, they tried to strip him of his uh, license and they did censor him. And then my crime was being on Fox News too much. So I had to go through page after page of transcripts from everything I'd said on Fox to see if I could satisfy beyond a reasonable doubt the faculty at Stanford to make sure that I hadn't said anything that was inflammatory, even though I'm not getting paid by Fox. I'm not a Fox paid consultant. And the funny thing was, Devin, and this is really important because it's asymmetrical. The person who at, in the faculty Senate, the chairman of the English department who brought all of these writs, so to speak, and wanted to censor or fire us, had founded Antifa on campus. 
And he had been guilty of taking over 70 Stanford students out on the San Mateo Bridge and stopping traffic and leading to 13 accidents and 70 students were arrested. And yet in his whole time he had been at Stanford, I think he'd only published one book, but he tweeted hundreds of thousands of times and he was suggesting that we weren't scholars and blah, blah, blah. So they finally go after everybody. And uh, I've had a, a lot of problems with Stanford University. I. You know, you, you think about, I used to use the Stanford studio. Can you imagine the studio calling you up one day and saying, if you want to go on Fox tonight, you're going to have to write out in advance everything you're going to say. And you'd say, I have no idea what they're going to ask me. And then, well, we've talked to Fox. I said, well, what did Fox say? He said, they wouldn't stand for what we're doing. So then I said, why would I stand for it? But that's, this is a, a center of higher le uh, learning, you know, and so it's mm -hmm. everywhere. And they think they can get away with it. And, but it doesn't uh, exist here at Truth. It doesn't exist here at True Social, which is good. So we're going to the new year, Victor. We're going to have the Truth Social will be uh, open and going, despite uh, all the all the naysayers. And we're very thankful for all the people who have, who are who are on True Social and watching this here today on on Rumble, who's our close partner. Um, Victor, I want to get I want to get your thoughts on uh, on Kissinger, um, but I do want to give you know just uh, remind people that Victor's a farmer. Uh, Victor used to go grapes. Victor, I've got grapes. I think you've tried my wine. You're not yeah. a big wine guy. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but I do. My wanna, wife likes you know, it. Yeah. Well, I want to, I want to, and, and you know what? I forgot. I'm, I was supposed to send you a bottle of wine. Now I'm going to have to, now that you've been you know, a guest on my show, I have to send you <laughs> a couple bottles of my wine, but I want to thank everybody who joined the founders club. It's almost full. We've got all the holiday packs. Hopefully you guys are all getting them before Christmas, but if you do order them now, we can get them to you, uh, hopefully uh, by the new year or shortly after after the new year. But um, but yeah, Victor, I know that Jennifer had some uh, the other night. We, we had dinner the other night uh, with you and uh, and your wonderful wife, and, and she enjoyed my wine. Yeah. yeah so we'll have does. to get you back. We're going to get you out of the almond business back into the grape business, I think. We have to take those well, I was a raisin. I, I grew raisins and table grapes for 20 years. Yeah. Um, and I came away. I still live here, and I'm looking at my almond orchard at dollar forty a pound right now. So it's below the cost of production. Um, yeah. So uh, it's not not necessarily. It was once very lucrative, but it's surely not now. But uh, yeah. And uh, so end of the year. What was your final question, well, Devin? For, well, for those of you, uh, oh, for those of you yeah. later on on audio, I'm going to play a clip. But you can go to DevinUnisWines.com. Uh, but I want to play one last clip, uh, Victor, and get your thoughts on the way out here, uh, because uh, Kissinger, one of the, um, uh, I think he was nearly 100 years old or right at 100 years old, yes. uh, had worked for Richard Nixon. Uh, but I want to play this clip and then get your comment. Are you asking me whether I would change anything that I had done? Yeah. What do you feel sorry for? I got, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you. I get asked that question often, and I would love to have an answer where I could say, if I only had done this one thing differently, then everyone would think I'm very open-minded. But the fact is, on the main lines of our policy, I wouldn't change anything. I try to do the best we could, and looking back on it, I have no second thought. Well, Victor, you're a man of history. Uh, you studied it. Um, we lost Henry Kissinger this year. Um, I think you had, had actually met him a few times. Yeah, he, he was a, actually a scholar. I wrote a book on uh, the Peloponnesian War. I wrote some scholarly articles that no one would read on Thucydides. I mean, who would ever read a book, uh, classical philology about the use of numbers in Thucydides? But things like that, I would get a note from him every once in a while. Hey, I really like this article. And then uh, I saw him a couple of times in Northern California and Every time he came by, he was surrounded by security, a lot of very wealthy, prominent people. If I happened to be walking by, I think this was true of a lot of people he knew, he would stop and he'd try to remember. He had a photographic memory. And he'd always say something like, uh, are you going to write on Herodotus now? Or he, So he was a scholar above all. And his memoirs, he had a, a big research staff, but if you read his three-volume memoirs, they're beautifully written. He was a very good pro stylist. As far as his... I mean, he got a lot of people angry on both sides. The, the Reaganites said that, you know, detente, uh, 
was a big mistake and that we win, they lose was a better. Uh, and I think that was true. But in his defense, Reagan really wasn't able to uh, see that through until he made fundamental changes in the American economy, unleashed capitalism, grew the economy at 7% in 1984, beefed up the military. And that was, if you look at where the government was in the 60s and 70s, we just didn't have that preeminence that we did in the early 80s. And so he thought that as a realist or a pragmatic person, he was going to do what he could. He had, we had peace in Vietnam. I mean, we had basically won the war. Uh, the South Vietnamese were analogous to the South Koreans. It was an autonomous country. All we had to do was to honor our agreements. And of course, 21 times the U.S. Senate run by Democrats cut off military aid to Vietnam. We couldn't even give them air support. And they were overrun by not, you know, a guerrilla faction, but by conventional North Vietnamese forces. So his vision actually would have worked and it did work until Watergate and Watergate discredited the, the Nixon administration and Kissinger. He was never in office after Jerry Ford. That was what was weird about him, you know, that for it's very hard to imagine that somebody for nearly 45 years would be the eminent diplomatic strategist that everybody asked advice about when that crisis came up, but no one would appoint him on our side, national security advisor or secretary of state again, because he had been pretty controversial. But I think he was right about that. It's hard to see. I disagreed with him on one decision, and that, that was when Turkey invaded Greece in 1974, and I had been to, uh, excuse me, invaded Cyprus, uh, but both NATO allies, he, he made the realist calculation that Turkey was bigger, more powerful. At that time, it was more pro-American. Greece was anti-American because of the coup and the Papadopoulos government. So anyway, what I'm getting prior Papadopoulos is that we tilted toward Turkey and really didn't sanction them for that illegal invasion where we, where they, you know, they killed thousands of Greeks. They, they ethnically cleansed 20, 200,000 people and sent them to the south uh, and they ruined cyprus and i thought he could have been a little bit more other than that yeah, I think cyprus cyprus remains south. divided today it does today you go there today and it's very sad because the, the affluent north that the greeks predominated and the impoverished south that was the turkish minority to the most part have been flipped so the greeks were forced down into the dry uh less affluent Cypriot South, and when you go there today, that's the booming part. And the North that the, the Turks inherited, it was highly developed, highly fertile, had all of the resource infrastructure, now is in decay. It's kind of like the East-West Germany phenomenon or North-South Korea phenomenon. Well, we've covered a wide range of topics here that only Victor Davis Hanson can do in depth. Victor, we could go on for hours. You're one of the uh, <laughs> most popular guests but i hope that everyone will you know get you can still you can order today victorhanson.com his book the end of everything um i know it's going to be a great book victor because your other books are are just phenomenal um and i know this is going to be a great book also um and of course you can follow victor at vdh everything that he posts on on his website will come up uh, on true social and Victor, are you uh, just final thoughts? You and, and your wonderful wife, are you spending Christmas uh, at the farm? Or are you going to be? Yeah, uh, yeah, we are. You know, we, I, I was on the road 50 days this fall and she was teaching all day. And finally, we're both on vacation. So we decided just to stay here in Salma. For the no, next three no weeks. mountains for you. Are you going to go to your cabin? Uh, I'm going to go to mountains tomorrow because of snow, of course. Uh, uh -huh. I'm getting a little old to blow snow and but that's what we're going to try to do tomorrow to make sure we keep up with it uh-huh and then coming back and spending christmas at the farm yeah excellent my friend well yeah. it's great to please say hello to jennifer for me and i, I want will. to thank all of you who have tuned in this year uh to the devin nunes podcast uh, unplugged now uh thank you for being part of true social and victor we will catch you in the next year this is Devin yep. Nunes. I look forward and to we'll it. We'll catch yep. you in 2024.